Gardens are good for your health in more ways than you may think. And a garden-minded community can mean a healthier place to live and thrive. Tonight we talk about growing a healthy community on this edition of Great Gardening. If you look, you actually see the growth for next year. This is a plant that's been infected with early blight. I can feed a lot of people. I always want to use a garden fork. You just wrap it. Take a look at the environment, try to work with your environment. Hello and thanks for being with us tonight. I'm Pamela Fish, welcoming back two of the healthiest, happiest guys I know. Tom Casper, Supervisor of Park Maintenance for the City of Duluth, and Bob Olin, a horticulturist and state County, state and county educator, and I mel mentioned earlier uh, your well-being, and, and truly, don't you think that comes from being a gardener? Oh, of course, it's all about gardening, right? That's right, <laughs> that's right, and thank you for recognizing that. I feel very happy and very healthy. Do you? Yes. And it's not because you've been pumping iron. It's <laughs> <laughs> well, it looks like it, but no, it's just pumping iron as in eating lots of iron-rich iron. vegetables. That's right, and there are a lot of them out there, and we want to talk about that tonight, so great. You know, um, Pam, it's, it is unique because gardening does combine the two things we need more of, more physical activity as mm -hmm. well as better nutrition, so right. it's, it's wonderful that way. It is good. Well, also, we want to welcome back our faithful phone volunteers, the Master Gardeners from St. Louis County, donating their time once again to staff our telephone bank. Please call them with your gardening questions at 218-788-2844 or call them toll-free 877-307-8762. They look like a healthy, happy bunch too, don't they? Yes, they do. They, right. Well, especially the guy in the middle. He looks very healthy. And <laughs> very, very healthy happy. and very happy. Coming up later this half hour, we'll have that drawing for the Deluxe Gas Barbecue Grill we displayed at the home show last week. So if you signed up for that, stay tuned. And, and we, there were several people that if they won, mm -hmm. they promised us dinner. Okay. <laughs> and we're holding them to it. Well, hopefully one of them wins. <laughs> well, we're going to just assume Because <laughs> there that were that several people good. who didn't promise that. <laughs> really? They can roast vegetables. We'll, we'll take a good steak as well. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> All right. Well, garden fresh produce, of course, is one of the best things you can eat. And some ways you can get it, if you're not growing your own, is through a farmer's market or a produce stand. But a growing movement across the region is called Community Supported Agriculture, or CSA. Here's a look at what it's all about. It's a partnership between um, farmers and community members, people who are concerned about where their where their food come from, where their food comes from, and how it's grown. Through the urbanization of the population, people there's lots of people in the cities who have no connection to the land. It used to be that your parents or grandparents, or you had some uncles or whoever out on the farm. But um, that's no longer the case for the majority of the people. For the customers to have the connection to the farm, um, a lot of people appreciate that. And, um, and then for the growers to have a bit more connection, uh, a stronger connection to, to a, a good share of your customers is um, rewarding. Each individual farm does things a little bit differently. Some of them have shares that are for only portions of the year or through the winter or just have meat or just have produce or some combination thereof. For produce, um, which is the most common um, CSA, you know, the, the marketing period or where people are signing up is through the winter and into the spring. One of the things we first planted on the farm was asparagus. So we, we have a pretty good crop of asparagus first thing in the spring. And uh, by the time we have a few other things um, coming out of the field, we were able to have a CSA packages together about the 1st of June. And because uh, um, we, we grow a lot of things uh, that are storage type also, root vegetables and cabbage and squash and that kind of thing, we generally have plenty of produce through November. It's more by the serving. Um, because um, a serving of uh, potatoes is a lot more than a serving of blueberries. I became aware of CSAs from, um, uh, from several farmers around the Twin Cities who have it, and, uh, and seeing the customers being real appreciative, it was, seemed very intriguing to me. Some of them just get very excited about 
It's like opening a Christmas present every week because they don't know for sure what's going to be in there. You know, eating seasonally is part of a part of the CSA experience. It's given us a lot more um, uh, opportunity to try to try some different things. The last couple of years now, we've grown um, sweet potatoes, and um, we're using the right techniques. We can we can uh, we can uh, grow some real nice sweet potatoes and. And people have really appreciated them, just as an example. So very encouraged for the season. Um, there's been the local food movement has been, which is CSA is part of, has been growing um, for the last uh, um, five or five to ten years, and uh, that si si shows no signs of abating. And um, so um, we're uh, we're looking forward to a real good growing season. Well, CSA Farms also work with the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, formerly the Food Stamp Program, and the goal, of course, is to make fresh food available to all income levels. So and it's great a, that way. Yeah, that's a recent change, and that's just an outstanding thing that we are, mm -hmm. as a community, finding ways to help all folks get good food. Right, right. So if you can do it, uh, try and uh, maybe buy a share. Great River Farms is going to deliver in Duluth this summer for the first time, but there are several other area CSA farms in our region. Uh, just look for Community Supported Agriculture right. CSA and, and you'll find out even more about them. All right, now we want to talk about the uh, healthful benefits of some of those particular crops. And Bob, we know you, that you have some information for us on some of the things that, that you see that are grown really just for their nutritional value. I mean, they taste good, too. Well, it's really interesting. I do teach a number of classes. I ask people why they participate, and we had a group on Tuesday night, and there could be a lot of reasons to garden, <laughs> economics being one, food security being another big one, but this group it was all about better nutrition. So uh, that's very high on people's lists. When we take a look at the leafy greens, many of these actually you can start planting right now. Uh, they're frost resistant, but here are a couple great ones, red sails, butter crunch lettuce. If you haven't tried that, Early in the season, these lettuces are wonderful, and they are really nice, nutrient-dense. And, of course, you can be a little bit creative. Uh, here's a little design pattern. We're encouraging people to plant some of these leafy greens with their other vegetable crops or their other flower gardens. Spinach, great early season mm -hmm. crop. You can see the salad on the right, which so is very nutritious. So much iron in that. It's so good for you. Very nutrient-dense. And when we talk about nutrient density, uh, some of the beets uh, that we've got lots of different choices, shioja, the candy striped beet and some of the golden beets, a nice combination of, uh, of nutrients in all of these real deep pigments, very nutritious. You know, the thing that's kind of interesting is that it's not just about vitamins, but this big group of phytochemicals. And these are, are those compounds which are really high in antioxidant potential, and this is what protects the cell structure and minimizes some of the tendency toward chronic disease. The great thing about beets is you've got nutrition in both the leaves as well as the roots. As a matter of fact, I think people are surprised by this. The beet leaves are actually have far more nutrient or vitamin content than the roots themselves. You can see the difference there in vitamin A as well as vitamin C. But the roots contain, um, of course, vitamins as well, but a real high density of these uh, pigments, the colored material. These are the antioxidants. So we get this combination in the beet of both the greens as I well as the I love that beet band. with the pink and the, and the red. What's that they're one called again? Fun. That one's called Seosia. That's an heirloom okay. which does real nice and there actually are a couple of, there's one called Guards Mark which is a selection of Seosia which is now uh, kind of taking over the market as well. So they're Had very some colorful. some of those last season. They were delicious. All right, thanks a lot Bob for that information. Time for question and answers. We've uh, already had some called in. The first one's from Marion in Duluth who received a tulip plant at Easter and wonders when and how to plant it outside. Well, <coughs> it was forced, of course, and we've mm -hmm. forced, of course. And uh, <laughs> generally, they're not going to survive that. But she can, after it's done blooming, she can, if she'd like to try to go out and plant those bulbs in the garden. Sometimes they'll survive, but often in a situation like that where they've been forced, it's really that one opportunity to enjoy it and then uh, discard them. But she can try to plant them. She'll want to plant them deep, six inches or so, allow the foliage to naturally die down and hope for the best for next year. Okay. Lori Fosnes from Culver wants to know when and how to prune her apple tree. Uh, we get this question a lot, but is it too late at this point? You know, it probably depends on where you're located. We really want those pruned before the buds break. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, in my opinion, it's a little late. The, the concern that we have, if you take these cuttings now rather than 
in late winter or very early spring. There's more disease pressure at this point, including some of the spores from uh, some of the bacterial diseases that, uh, in particular, fire blight, that can be very damaging to a, an apple. So I would probably wait until next winter before I pruned. And um, I've been hearing the, some concerns about uh, the, the frost late after the warm temps and how that's affecting some of our fruit trees. Really didn't affect us at all. Our okay. buds hadn't really broken. This is some of the media that's come out of the yeah. Twin Cities and mm -hmm. farther south where they actually broke bud. And uh, mm -hmm. at that point, uh, they, they did have some damage to, uh, to some of these flowers because they were too far along. But ours really hadn't progressed. And we're not going to see any ill effects from that warm March followed by the cold April that we've had. So reason number 101 to live in the Northland. Live in the Northland <laughs> and, and to get your advice only from local PBS That's right. sources, right? All right. <laughs> um, some questions came from the home show. We have some being called in, and please continue to call them in. But we're going to go through some that, that we got at the home show as well. Is there a vine that will grow in the shade, uh, something maybe like clematis? Well, clematis doesn't do real well in the shade. There's mm -hmm. a couple uh, bittersweet sweet will do okay but there's a couple of better ones there's a hydrangea vine that has the beautiful flowers that we're used to on some of our hydrangeas very slow growing so people will have to be patient with it the other, the other one is dutchman's pipe which is the in the dicentra family so it has a flower similar to a bleeding heart um, is a very nice delicate vine that will grow in the shade all right where's a good place to find prairie flowers well we do have uh a couple of sources. Uh, I'll mention the name: Prairie Restorations, obviously. But people need to be. Is that the one in Cloquet? They they do have a local uh, boreal natives. Boreal natives, yeah. They've okay. got a local uh, component. But people should be aware this isn't really prairie country, uh -huh. and uh, you really want to be planting some of the more native materials uh, for for better success. So Such as popple trees. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, we actually have a lot of native uh, shrubs that, that really are, are very, very nice, including we got a lot of the pin cherries, choke cherries, uh, some of these materials that are beginning to emerge right now. So we really do have a lot of selections, but they're really not in the prairie flower uh, kind of category. Okay. Here's a, a question about bamboo. How do you get rid of it? Well, bamboo uh, isn't a true bamboo, what we have in this area. It's, a, it's what we call a polygonum our fleece flower, and uh, I really think in that case, because that's a very aggressive, very invasive plant, and probably the best thing to do would be let it grow out, cut it back, and let it re-sprout, and then spray it with uh, glyphosate or Roundup in the fall of the year. It's very, very challenging to dig, and it can be very, very aggressive. I've actually seen where it's, uh, mm. it's actually damaged uh, block foundations and so forth. So black top driveways. Black top driveways yeah. and so forth. <clears throat> so it's worth trying to eliminate, but you're going to have to... Uh, Cut it back and then probably spray it. Very difficult to get it out any other way. And mm -hmm. really, the, yeah, the really the best time to do that, as Bob mentioned, is in the fall. And mm -hmm. really, from about August fifteenth to maybe September fifteenth, okay. uh, cut it down, allow it to actively grow, and then treat it, and you should get a pretty good kill on it. Jan in Duluth wants to know about coffee grounds. Are they good to put in the garden as is? And certainly in, in minor amounts, I think, it, you really want to compost things first, including coffee grounds. There's some acidity there, and that's all taken care of by the, uh, by the composting process. Uh, direct applicating, small amounts, doesn't make much difference. But large quantities, we can have some difficulty there with a lot of the intermediate acids as these materials decompose. Compost them first, and then they really are a, a good component to, to add to the garden. Okay. And, and that really is a great way, again, as we are concerned about landfills and things like that, to start pulling those kinds of things out of our, uh, our garbage stream and into our compost stream and then back into our garden. So. Sure. Okay, we're going to have to hold on the questions for now. Lots of good information. Uh, but moving on to uh, some of the other items that we wanted to provide information on. Um, gardening improves your health with exercise and fresh air. And also it can mean a great sense of well-being for the gardener and his or her neighborhood. So here's Tom to take us across the city in tonight's Great Garden Tour. We're at one of the many public gardens that clubs within the Duluth Garden Flower Society maintain as public beautification efforts and it's really built around wanting to beautify our community. Now this is a garden maintained by the Hortus Garden Club and they've been around for decades. Originally it was a men's garden club. Of course today now there's both men and women in the garden club. It's really such a wonderful premise I think that that these folks care so much about their community that they come out and spend their time to beautify it and to do things like this that are such a proud point 
for, for all the communities that these gardens are in. We've got, of course, day lilies that uh, finish blooming, but we also have some Asiatic lilies coming along. We have hostas, we have obedient plant, we have sedum, dahlias, shrub roses that are in bloom behind us, the, the beautiful pink and Wygela behind us here with the red. So lots of opportunity for color and enjoyment right here in just this little triangle of land. We have about 600 members in the society um, that are in about 30 different clubs. Some of the clubs have as many as 50 members, others have as few as a half dozen. You'll notice that each of our, our gardens um, that are maintained by clubs within the society, we have a sign recognizing each of those garden clubs. And it's really um, recognition for the job well done and it's also recognition for the community around that, uh, to know that this is a club that's helping maintain their, their community. We see rather large gardens like the one we're standing in today that uh, have multiple beds and with lots of interesting plants to, to a little simpler gardens. Well, now we're at the Smithville one. This garden is, is really dedicated to a couple of its, its founding members, Ray Piccinato and Don Anderson. Both uh, gardened this plot uh, extensively. Both of them have since passed away. We're right along Highway 23 out here in West Duluth. Um, so some of our, our public gardens that our clubs maintain are in its small little quiet areas that maybe only that neighborhood sees. Others, well-traveled, heavily traveled areas and are really here as public beautification to show those passerby that this community and this neighborhood cares about how they look. What a great effort, and your garden clubs do wonderful things for... Can we watch that again? <laughs> <laughs> it was really pretty, um, but we have to show something else here, and this is um, something that one of the garden clubs came up with, and it's called Garden Art. It's just made with uh, some dishes that they found, things they put together, and that you can put in your, in your gardens, in your window boxes, in your pots, made by the bookworms garden club, and they're using it as a fundraiser, and then the money they raise will be used to buy plants for their garden at the Duluth Public at Library. Public so Library, yeah. yet another effort to really beautify a, a public area yeah. through, through their <coughs> efforts. We have, we have, the Society is such a great organization mm -hmm. that cares so much about this community and the beautification of this community, both Duluth Superior, up the North Shore, up into Island Lake and all other places. Just a lot of commitment for beautifying our surroundings. So. You know, gardening really does unify a community, and, and it provides all this beauty for the people that live there as well as everyone that's traveling that's right. through the area. So thanks to everyone that, for this effort because they, they really do make a difference. Volunteers right. sure do. Well, we have to uh, take care of our volunteers who are answering the phones and take some of the questions <laughs> that they've been bringing in to us. Uh, Teresa from Finland has snowball hydrangea planted last fall. Says it looks dead. Will it come back? And do I need any fertilizer for that? I'll, I'll handle that one. You may handle it. <laughs> well, snowball hydrangea or Annabelle hydrangea basically die to the ground every year. It really is a shrub that acts more like a perennial. So, Teresa, not to worry. If those, if, if she can just cut those canes off, get it cleaned up, and there will be new growth coming from the ground more than likely. If she doesn't see new growth coming from the ground, it is indeed dead. Okay. You know, you might say she planted in the fall, and you need to be aware of one thing. This is a very winter hardy plant, but it needs a little time to get established. So sure. if you are planting late in the fall, let's get a good layer of mulch on there so it has an opportunity to get established. But more than likely, she's going to be okay. Yeah. All right. Tim from Cloquet has well-established blueberry plants, and when can he move them? And I have a follow-up blueberry question. Okay. He <laughs> wants to go immediately. Okay. Uh, blueberries are shallow rooted and actually even though they're mature, uh, they do transplant quite well. Again, well drained, good site, full sun and acidic soil and you should be fine. And the follow up question uh, is one we took earlier at the home show says, should I cut the flowers off my new blueberry shrubs before I plant them? Another good question. It's very hard to do, but you've got to take those first flowers off for the first and maybe the second year. You can leave one or two so you know you've got blueberries later in the season. <laughs> but they'll do so much better if you... Well, you really, it's about establishment. Uh -huh. You really don't want any energy going into that fruit. You want it all down in the roots and you want to establish those plants because once these new blueberries are established, uh, they can live 50, 60, 70 years. But, sure. So you've got to sacrifice that first little bit of yield. On, on a bright year. note, you don't have to do that with flowers. <laughs> 
enjoy okay. them. Are you, they're always edible? <laughs> yeah, they're always edible. Okay, <laughs> Mike from Esco says he's been <clears throat> composting walnut shells from the grocery store, not black walnuts. Um, any problem with toxicity in the garden? And uh, if so, how long would it take to get rid of that? Pretty tough. I, I think yeah. that um, with all of these things, there can be a little bit of what we call sour mulch that occurs on some of the woodier products. The secret is just to uh, disperse it widely with and mix it in with other materials and, and then manage your compost pile so that it's good and warm and it'll ultimately break down. And I wouldn't okay. hesitate. And he may be referring to the concern about the root system of the black walnut and creating some toxicity yeah. around that in the soil for certain vegetables. The okay. shell itself is almost pure carbon. You just got to yeah. break that down. There shouldn't be an issue. All right. Lynn from Duluth says some of the maples get red uh, bumps all over the leaves. What is this and should something be sprayed on them to prevent it? It's a mite. It's called an aerified mite um, that generally just burrows into the forming leaf tissue and creates its own little home. It's not going to destroy or damage the, the tree. It, it can be a bit unsightly as they, as they come and go, but it's nothing that she should need to spray for. Okay. Carolyn Duluth thinks she has spruce budworm. The ends are brown and dropping off. What should she spray on it? Well, she doesn't have spruce budworm yet because okay. it, these will actually emerge um, as the buds themselves emerge. But she does point out the fact that, and she may have had some damage last year, uh, they can be extremely damaging, and this is a case where you probably want a labeled material, and you buy a number of insecticides uh, at most outlets uh, that will take care of the problem. But only when you see the, the small larvae, little quote-unquote worms, mm -hmm. doing their damage, and this isn't going to be about until about mid-May or so. Okay. Um, we talked about edibles that are nutritious. Pat from Herbster says that... Uh, Purslane that we talked about last week is is also edible, and she says more nutritious than spinach. Is that true? Boy, I don't really know. <laughs> I don't see. think it tastes quite as good as spinach, right. but um, it is interesting. Some of these quote unquote weeds mm -hmm. are actually being selected for and actually being introduced. A uh, purslane grows right on the ground. Most gardeners yeah. have had it. It's easy to pull out and easy to use. But, is that uh, the one they call pigweed? Or my no, totally different. That's different uh, different okay. families and so forth. And I'll take purslane <laughs> any day over pigweed. Yeah. So I don't <laughs> think pigweed is edible, and it's much more aggressive, and okay. it, it's a real tough seed setter. All so. right, mixing up our weeds there. <laughs> um, Cheryl from Duluth has planted elder, elderberry bushes and raspberries from bare root and plants in pots. The bare root ones died, but the potted ones survived. Uh, wondering what she might have done wrong there. Well, certainly anything that you plant that's bare root is going to need additional care over something that you plant that's containerized. Containerized mm -hmm. has developed a root system, can retain that moisture, can actively grow, whereas a bare root basically comes with very little of its root system intact and needs time for that to establish. So she's going to need additional care anytime she plants a bare root tree over, or, or uh, shrub over a containerized one so okay. really good points B bare root if you get it you receive it only in the early part of the year and then you really have to be careful with it. so many times people let them dry down so mm -hmm. if you get bare root stock make sure you got the moist material around it until you put it in the ground get it going very early so but all you're right. right otherwise just use container growth. he said right. i'm right i'm gonna write that <laughs> Good, good information, but we, but we need to move on. You go, you go ahead and make a note. <laughs> now we want to take a look at even more garden inspiration for the upcoming season. Here's this week's Grow and Show. This ground cover of Sweet Woodroof in Martha's Garden in Washburn, Wisconsin is something she longingly awaits in the spring of each year. Martha calls it her cloud in the woods. And from the gardens of Jerry Bonassi, some newly introduced hydrangea varieties including the vanilla strawberry, also a bright periwinkle blue called Twist and Shout, and an even deeper blue-toned Endless Summer, all proven hardy in northern climates. Please send photos of your plants and flowers to greatgardening at wdse.org, or if you can't email, send them to us at 632 Niagara Court, Duluth, Minnesota, 55811. Beautiful stuff, and I know those hydrangeas are going to be featured in your spring garden extravaganza. We have a little reminder about that at the end of the show. We also want to remind the garden lovers out there that Great Gardening takes an annual bus tour to the Twin Ports Area Gardens in July. We've all loved doing that. This year, though, we're also heading 
to Northwest Wisconsin for a spring Bayfield garden tour. And uh, we're going to tour gardens in Iron River, Bayfield, and La Pointe. We're going to ride the ferry to Madeline Island, tour Hauser's Superior View Farm and Orchard. And uh, you can call the station for tickets. I think there's just a handful of tickets left for this spring tour, which is on Sunday, May 20th. All right, well, time for the drawing. We have a, a beautiful right. gas grill. I don't know, if, Bob, Do if you want to move, a, yeah, I can. move aside. We can see the grill over here, and uh, we had so many people sign up for that at the home show. Go ahead and pull out one of the uh, yes. one of the tickets, Tom. All right. We'll see who the winner is. No, it was very, very secure. All right. And the winner is... I'll get... Whoops. Oh, boy. It's really small writing, too. Kent, G-I-E-S-E. -E, I think it's Geis. Geis or Geese. Geese. And uh, Kent's from Duluth. So congratulations to Kent. And uh, we'll contact you about... Uh, Picking up your gas All grill. All right, congratulations, All right. Ken. Good job on the drawing. Okay, we have a couple reminders about um, calendar items coming up. The Duluth Garden Flower Society luncheon is coming up, and that's a week from Saturday. That's right. And um, there's a guest speaker there called the Renegade Gardener. That's right. We have uh, Don Engebretson coming up from the cities. He's written eight or nine books about gardening in, uh, in Minnesota. Very knowledgeable, very interesting, very um, funny sort of presentation. I'm sure folks will love it. And a um, quick reminder about the Spring Garden Extravaganza. Uh, this is the information you're going get, to get from that. And uh, that's coming up this weekend. And the three of us will be there. We'll be there. 229 pages and Tom's read it all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and retain none of it. Uh, all right. 8, 8.30, come to the door okay. at Herman Down High School. Great. Well, thanks again to our phone volunteers from St. Louis County Master Gardeners, our garden experts, Bob and Tom, and, of course, all of you who called in. That's all the time we have. But from all of us here, thanks for watching and enjoy the garden.